Amen. Go with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. And to help us consider the truth we'll hear this morning, if you were to go to a Cardinals game, who will you see wearing a jersey? Just the players? No, there'll be thousands of people. Hundreds probably wearing one that says Molina on it, but that does not mean there are hundreds of people named Molina. How then can you tell who the real Molina is? Well, you might be tempted to say, I'll see who's on the field, but I've been to baseball games. It's not that hard to get on the field. You might get arrested afterwards, but it's not that hard to get on the field. To be clear, I've never done that. I just want to clarify. The safest way to identify the real Molina is to look and see who is on the field sitting in the dugout, who catches the ball behind the plate. We look for the one who is doing the job to advance the cause of the Cardinals. We know the real Molina because he is on the field playing his position with his team. In the same way, this is how we can know who is a true Christian. It's not about whether we dress like it or look like it or if we have Christian clothing, because they sell that at Walmart to anybody. You don't have to show ID. It's not even about whether we show up to church. The real way to identify a Christian is whether they are working with their church in their role to glorify God and love one another. This is one of the reasons we're gathered to baptize Colin and Alice. They have both been among our church, living out their faith, and they want to become part of our church, and we want to publicly proclaim them as true Christians through baptism. So in Galatians 6, we are going to see three specific commands that God gives to every Christian. He calls every Christian to be part of his work in counseling. We've spent the the last two weeks, this is our third week in a series, seeing God's call to be confident in counseling one another. We saw in the first week God's power in the gospel, that we are able to counsel one another. We saw in the second week the tool, the prescription we should use in the scriptures. Today we will see that God's design for his people is to be part of the counseling process process. Would you pray with me and ask God to help us understand the word today? Father, we are thankful for your truth. We're thankful that these songs we've sung, that you are everlasting arms who hold us up. You've given us a church that can rise up and be faithful. God, that you are all we need. We thank you for these songs. We thank you for the truth that they tell us, and we thank you for the truth the scriptures tell us. We pray, open our hearts and our minds that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For you are our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll read through Galatians 6, 1 to 10. So we have the context of our verses. Galatians was written by Paul to the churches of Galatia, a region in modern-day Turkey, who were uh, being corrupted. They were being taught by false teachers who were claiming, you must be legalist, you must do this, you must follow the law of Moses, uh, many foolish things. And so after dealing with much of that heresy, and then in chapter 5 he teaches them, here's how you know what a true Christian is, because they're walking according to the Spirit, and we get that list of the fruit of the Spirit that many of us know. He then says in chapter 6, verse 1, brothers, and that would imply and sisters in the same way we say you guys, and we mean men and women. So brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Paul is discussing the role of Christians in the lives of one another. 
And the first and most important thing, he says, we must bear with one another. And by doing so, we're fulfilling the law of Christ. We'll start in verse 2 because I believe verse 2 is the primary command, the primary verse of the par paragraph. Everything else is related to that. Verse 1 tells us how. Verses 3 and 5 give us reasons. So verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is really helpful for us, but I think often we hear this and we say, okay, so that means I have to put up with that really annoying guy who goes to church. And some of you are thinking that that's me, but that's not what this means. He literally means bear one another's burdens. When someone in our church has a burden, we help them bear it. We don't bear with them because they're annoying. We help them bear the burden they are being crushed by. These burdens were used to refer to heavy loads that were difficult or probably impossible for one person to carry alone. Things like deep emotional struggles with anxiety or depression or spiritual problems like oppressive temptation or discouragement. Paul is calling us to actively, purposely, intentionally, and in an ongoing way, this isn't do it once, the way he's written this verb in Greek is an ongoing thing, bear the burdens that we all face. What does that look like practically? Well, we're going to talk about that later on and certainly through the rest of this series. But for now, let us focus on the fact that doing so fulfills the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? Well, Christ taught us that he fulfilled the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law, which we read this morning. And I'm thankful that Clint read that. And some of those laws, you were like, that is super weird. I've never reaped my field, much less to the edge. Why are we reading this super weird verse in church? Well, one, it's the word of God. And two, it's a reminder that this is one of the great joys of being a Christian, is now we don't have to worry about the, how far of the, the field we reap, or all these different little specific things. We just have the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? Well, Jesus summarized it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as Moses wrote in Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Because we love God, because of who he is, we love one another. In Galatians 5, 14, just the previous chapter, Paul quoted Jesus saying that the whole law is fulfilled in this one command. But how does bearing one another's burdens fulfill the law of Christ? Well, because when we love one, someone else by bearing their burdens, we're loving them like we would want to be loved. If you were carrying something that was too heavy for you to carry, unless we're just super prideful, we would want someone to help us. So we're loving others as we would want to be loved. We're loving our neighbor as ourself. And I think it's important for us to start here because if we don't, we're going to be tempted to take this whole passage legalistically. We're going to think, okay, I have to bear three burdens this week, and then Jesus will love me. And that's not what Paul is saying. Rather, he is reminding us of the gospel of Christ. Because, yes, we fulfill the law of Christ, but even more importantly, Christ fulfilled the law of Christ and the law of Moses and every law. He fulfilled it all for us. We have hope today because Jesus bore our burden. And, and what burden did he bear? the burden that none of us could carry that was too heavy, that we could not hope to move in our strength or even in the strength of those around us, the burden of our sin. As Peter said in his first letter, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Friends, Jesus himself was perfect and holy and sinless. He himself bore our burdens. The holy, fully divine God of the universe bore our sins on himself. He took the weight of our own sins. And this is really important. Not just sins, but our sins. Jesus took the weight of guilt that we feel and the sin of pornography usage and addictions. He put himself under the pressure of our anxiety and our fear and our hopelessness. He carried the shame of our public failures and broken promises. And because he took the wounds and the punishment and the death that we deserved, because he bore that burden for us, we can be healed. Not because we do a better job bearing it or not even because we get help, but because he bore it fully for us. That's our only hope. We cannot move this burden, but he bore it for us. By his wounds, we are healed. By his death, we are forgiven. By his resurrection, we have life. The joy of this is that we don't have to carry around this burden anymore because one, we couldn't in the first place, and two, we don't have to ever pick it up again. He has fully borne our burden. 
So friends, if you are here today and you have never placed your faith in Christ, if you are still trying to carry the burden of your guilt and your shame and your sin in your own heart, just know that Jesus stands ready to save you. He bore our sins. We rejoice in that. But he stands ready to forgive you. He can bear your sin as well. So if you've never placed your faith in Christ, please talk with me. Talk with another church member here today. We would love to help you come to Christ and be free of that burden. We would love to fulfill the law of Christ. Believers, I want you to note a slightly different thing in the verse. Why did Jesus bear our burdens? Why did he bear our burdens? Well, it says he, bared, he bore our burdens so that we could die to sin and walk in righteousness. Not so that we could just get out of jail or get out of hell free card. That's not why he died. He died so we could walk in righteousness, so we could put off sin and put on good works. He died so that we could bear one another's burdens. This isn't an optional thing. This is what Christianity is. We must bear one another's burdens. That's why Christ died. And we are able to because when we do, we are following the Spirit. Look back to verse 1. He says, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Now, you may be tempted to think, okay, this is exactly what I was worried about. I'm not spiritual, so this doesn't apply to me. But friends, that's not what Paul is saying with the term spiritual. Flip back to just one chapter to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he gives us two lists. He gives a list of what it looks like to follow the flesh, so of envy, drunkenness, anger, idolatry, immorality. Then he gives us a second list that we would know what walking by the Spirit looks like, and that list is full of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all these things, all these good things. And then he summarizes in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So friends, when Paul, just a few verses later, says, let you who are spiritual, he's referring to those who walk by the Spirit. And I think this helps us in two different ways. We can apply this to two different groups. The first are those here who may say, I could never bear someone else's burden. I am not spiritual enough. And I understand that, that thought, but Friends, the honest truth is the scriptures just simply don't speak of spirituality that way. There is no spectrum that we can rank ourselves as more or less or enough. Either we are walking in growing obedience to the Spirit, or we are walking according to the flesh. At any moment, as Christians, we are doing one or the other. And all Christians, at all times, are in one of those two groups. Either we're walking the Spirit in obedience, or walking the flesh in disobedience. That is the only options. There's no spectrum where you're kind of in between. You're either doing one or the other. So Paul does not reserve the work of restoration for perfect Christians or super Christians or pastors even. It is the work of every Christian. So to those here who are fearful to be part of God's work of restoration, God defines believers as those who are spiritual because they're filled with the Spirit, because they are walking in accordance with the Spirit. So I pray that you would walk confidently in obedience and you would work towards restoration because the Scriptures say it's your job. Secondly, let me speak to those here who say, oh yes, I definitely am spiritual. I can't wait to share my great spirituality with other people. If that's you today, again, that's just not how the Bible speaks of spirituality. The, the person walking in their 40th year of faithfulness in obedience to Christ is just as spiritual as the one walking in their fourth day of obedience to Christ. Because it's not about maturity or how much Bible we know or how much experience. It's about are we obeying the Spirit or not. And notice what Paul says to those who are so spiritual. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. If this was written to those who had like advanced beyond the possibility of sin, he wouldn't need to say that. Instead, he's writing it to all of us who are tempted all the time. This verse, in a sense, is Paul's ancient version of, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Help people, but don't help people out of pride. 
It's just the opposite. We as Christians, those who are spiritual, will face temptation. We must restore one another. We must do it carefully, not in pride, thinking we are reaching down to help the lowly, but thinking we are also lowly and we are helping them. So to those who are proud, hear God's word. God defines believers as those who are spiritual because they're filled with the Spirit, not because of good works or good attitudes or good anything in us, because of God. So let us restore one another in confidence in the Holy Spirit, not in us. We are able to bear with one another. We don't have an excuse. We can't say we're not spiritual enough. The Spirit makes us spiritual. And not only are we able to bear with one another, we must bear with one another because we are family together in the church. Look at how verse 1 begins. Paul addresses them not as, hey, you random group of people who show up to a building on Sunday mornings at the same time. He says, brothers and sisters. And because we're family, we respond to anyone in the family who's caught in any transgression. Anyone. Anyone. It, It doesn't matter who it is. It's certainly a subset of brothers, so we're not saying anyone in the whole world, anyone of the brothers and sisters in their local church. But you don't get to say, I'll restore this, this friend that I like, but that annoying guy over there, I'm not gonna, that's not how it works. Anyone. And it's anyone who is caught in any transgression. Any transgression. This word transgression and the way it's combined with the word caught, it's a word picture that Spurgeon describes as Christians falling into transgression on account of their traveling slowly on the road to heaven. Like they've kind of fallen behind the group and sin sneaks up and catches them. Uh, like, a, like a wounded wildebeest on the savannah. When we allow sin to slow us down, we will be caught by the sin that follows so close behind. But they are our family. And if we see them as family, then we won't just judge them for having been trapped. We will go to them and help them up because they're our family. And we do that by restoring them in a spirit of gentleness. What does it mean to restore? Well, I think sometimes we think restore simply means help someone back up and then move on. Like they, they're caught in a bear trap and we open the trap and we're like, okay, go ahead. That's not the word here. Think about when you taught your kids how to ride your bike or ride their bike. They fall over. You don't just put them back on the bike and push them without any more instruction just so they crash again. That is unloving. That's not restoration. Restoration is you help them up. You put them back on the bike. You explain what they did wrong. You hold them as they start going and you help them to avoid crashing again. Restoration is more than simply helping them up. It is helping them up and helping them avoid falling into the same trap again. And we must be done in a spirit of gentleness with meekness and humility, not in a condemning, condescending way, but gently. And you say, okay, I can stomach having to restore people, but I know myself, I can't do it gently. I got a short fuse. I'm easily annoyed. People are awful. I can't restore gently. But what does Paul say in the previous chapter when he lists the fruit of the Spirit? One of the parts of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. So if you say, I'm not gentle, then you're saying, I'm not filled with the Spirit. That's a dangerous thing to say. Now, gentleness may be harder for you, but here's the joy. The Spirit is pretty powerful. So you don't have to feel it. What You don't have to well it up. You don't have to manufacture it. You certainly don't have to wait till you feel gentle to say something. The Spirit promises to build gentleness in you when you walk according to the Spirit. Friends, whatever sin it is, whoever it is that sin, God calls us to restore one another as family gently, lovingly. And this is really hard. I thought of three ways this is hard. It's it's really hard when our friend is caught in a sin that we don't understand, that we have no experience with. We're like, why would you do that? That's so gross and weird. It's hard to be gentle. It's hard to be gentle when our brother is caught in a sin that we already have victory over. We fought that battle 10 years ago. We can't believe they're so foolish to fall into it now. And we struggle when they are caught in a sin that has deeply hurt us in the past. Our father was an angry, abusive man, and so my friend is becoming angry, and I can't deal with that because of my past experience. But friends, what does the Scripture say? If anyone is caught in any transgression, the Spirit will help us restore them gently, regardless of what has happened to us. How do we know that's true? Because Christ has loved us that way. He's the Holy One. He never sinned. He doesn't understand the appeal of our sin more than we could ever imagine, and yet he treats us gently in our sins. He's also our sympathetic high priest. He was tempted in all ways like we are. He won the battle, and yet he is gentle and lowly and kind in our sin. And friends, Christ 
the sacrificial lamb, knows more than we could ever imagine what it's like to be hurt by other people's sin. And yet he is gentle and kind and lowly in heart. The same gentle Christ who was gentle through the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the same Holy Spirit to be gentle to one another. Friends, we can be gentle. We can restore. No matter the transgression or aggressor, we can restore. And Paul gives us this command because we're family and also because as believers, all of us are flawed. Again, look to verses 3 and 5, or 3 through 5. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Notice verse 3 begins with the word for. This means Paul is giving us reasons why we must restore, why we must fulfill the law of Christ. He gives two primary reasons. The first is because some of us think we are above bearing one another's burdens. We think we really are something. We're too good. We're too holy to reach down and deal with that. But Paul warns us, if we think we're something when we're unwilling to love one another, we are really nothing. We are self-deceived. For those who are truly in Christ will fulfill the law of Christ. They will bear one another's burdens. Friends, consider if Christ was not too holy to bear our burdens, you are not too holy to bear burdens for one another. And then look to verse 5. Paul says, each one will have to bear his own load. And at first, this really confused me because Paul just said, bear one another's burdens. But the key to understanding this is considering the difference between a burden and a load. This is very clear in Greek, but it's even clear in English. A burden is something that goes beyond our capacity. A burden would be something painful, difficult, crushing. No Christian is expected to bear their burden on their own. But in contrast to load, A load is what we're expected to carry. If you buy a pickup truck, it has a load capacity, what it's expected to carry. If it couldn't carry what the load, you would, I mean, you'd sue, right? It wasn't as advertised. In the same way, in their culture, your load was what you were expected to carry on a long, difficult travel on foot for many miles. You have to carry your own food and water. That was your load. So friends, in the same way as Christians, we are each given our own responsibilities, We must carry our own load. Christ has called each of us to carry our own cross. We can't just pass that off to someone else. We must carry our own cross, bear our own load. This is why Paul calls us to test our own work, not someone else's work, but our own work. We are each responsible for the load, the normal expected everyday weight of bearing our own cross. And yet in our pride, when we're surrounded by truly loving, helpful, gracious people who want to help us, sometimes we take advantage of that and we say, okay, carry my burden, but also carry my load too. Just take care of all my responsibilities. I don't, I'm just going to give up everything to someone else. Friends, Paul confronts that pride and selfishness. He says we must test our own works. We must carry our own load And he says, if we do, then we'll be able to boast in ourselves and not our neighbor. We can't boast in our neighbor. Now, I don't think Paul is saying, go around boasting about how great we are. That would be contrary to everything else Paul has ever said. So we look down to verse 16 of chapter 6. Paul says, but far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I think Paul's point then, both in verse 16 and here in our passage, is that we cannot boast in what Christ is doing in someone else. I can't find hope for my own soul or my own salvation because my wife is growing in faithfulness. I can't declare myself crucified to the world because Alice puts off sin. I can't declare the world dead to me because Colin is growing in righteousness. And as your pastor, I'm tempted to do this. I'm like, look how much my church is growing. I'm thankful for that, but that says nothing about my soul. Each of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged for our own works, for how we carried our own load. Yes, we're commanded to bear one another's burdens, but we cannot take advantage of that command and make others carry all our responsibilities. This is why God commands us to bear one another's burdens, because He knows we're tempted to think we're above it, and He knows we're tempted to think we're below it. We're tempted to get around it one way or the other. We don't obey because we think our time is too precious to give to bearing another burden, like we have our own stuff to deal with. We think our energy is too limited to call that friend. We think we are something special and we don't need to get wrapped up in things like this. But friends, do not be deceived. 
God calls us all to bear one another's burdens. We can't get out of it because we think we're too busy or too holy or too whatever. In the same way, we are often tempted to take advantage of this command. We think our energy is too precious to fulfill God-given responsibilities, so we pass them off to someone else in the church. We say, well, the whole church is reading the Bible, so I don't need to read, or everyone else prayed on Thursday, so I don't need to pray on Thursday, or everyone else came to church, I don't need to come to church. We'll just let other people do it for us. Friends, do we think our time would be better spent relaxing and letting others pick up the slack? How is that not selfishness and pride? Do we think we know better than God when He told us to carry our own load? I hope not. He knows better than us. I can promise you that. God calls us all to bear not only one another's burdens, but to bear our own load as well. Whether we think we're too strong or too weak, it still applies equally. And let me make a special application to our kids. So little ones, look right at me. God has called you to carry your own load. So when you go to school or dance class or baseball practice, who carries your bag? Do you carry it or does your friend carry it? You carry it. Why? Is it yours? You have to carry it. In the same way, if you have believing parents, that's a wonderful thing. I'm glad your parents believe in God, but God is calling you to believe in Him. You can't find hope in your parents' faith. You must find hope in your faith. You must find hope in Christ, the object of your faith, the one you are putting faith in. Jesus is calling you to bear your own load, to believe yourself, not just say, well, my parents are Christian, so I'm good. You say, I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus for myself. And I also want to make the same application to those here who are uh, here to celebrate Alice and Colin on their baptism. I'm glad that these two people believe. I, I can't wait to baptize them, that they'd be part of our membership. But friends, be warned, God is not going to let you off the hook just because they are being faithful. That's not how it works. Each one is expected to have their own faith, to carry their own cross, to endure crucifixion of the world. You will not be saved simply because your relative or your friend is being baptized or saved. God is calling you to believe. If you would like to believe, we'd love to help you with that. Colin and Alice would love to help you with that. Know that you must carry your own load. Friends, we must all bear with one another for so many reasons. But that's not the only way God involves us in the life of one another in the church. The second way that we show we are truly on God's team is we share with one another. Look at verses 6 to 8. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh or from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God, friends, uh, friends, God calls us with two reasons why we must share, for, uh, share with one another. The first is that we do it to provide teaching to one another. Look at verse 6 again. Paul says, those who are taught the word, I think that must, must mean members of the local churches he is writing to, should share all good things with the one who teaches them. They should provide for their pastors financially and for their church financially. This meaning is made especially clear when we compare this passage with 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul uses very similar language. He said to that church, if we, their preachers, have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much? We reap material things, money from you. And in verse 14, it makes it even more clear. In the same way, the Lord Jesus commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. The clear teaching of Scripture that those, is that those who are taught the word should sacrificially and financially support their pastors and their churches. This is not something for super Christians. This is not like once you've been a member for five years, then your membership dues kick in. It's all Christians support the teaching of the gospel. It's a basic act of obedience to Jesus. If we're not sacrificially and financially supporting our church, we're living in sin. And it's tempting to think that Paul just abruptly changed topics here, where he was talking about bear one of those burdens, and he's like, make sure you pay your pastors is a totally separate issue but that's generally not how Paul writes. Plus, verses 1 to 5 are clearly about caring for one another. Verses 9 to 10 are clearly about caring for one another. Thus, I think we must interpret verses 6 to 8 as being about caring for one another. How does paying your pastors or supporting your church care for one another? Well, I think we often don't think about that at all. 
when we give, we probably think about how our giving pleases God, which I hope we do. That is the most important reason to give is to glorify God. And we might even think about how our giving supports our pastors or pays for our building. Those are good things as well. But Paul is calling us to consider giving because it directly loves and helps one another. Consider when you give to your church, you're providing for a building to sit in and hear the word taught. When you give to your church, you're providing for the electricity and the heat and the air conditioning to make it at least a little comfortable in the building. You're providing classrooms and snacks and water and bulletins, projectors and a million other things, but most importantly, you are providing for the teaching and preaching of God's word. And if we all stop giving, all that goes away. When we give to our church, we are giving for the sake of our neighbors, our community, and most importantly, for our fellow church members, right? This is the, the call of small businesses in town. They're like, hey, support small business because it helps the community, and that's good, and I'm all for that. In the same way, yet even more, we support our church because it helps our community. It helps one another. It is our responsibility to be focused on the community as we give. We write our checks with our women's ministry in mind, that they would be able to be provided teaching materials and encouragement. We, we give with our children's ministry in mind so that we can provide teaching to our young ones as they grow in their love for Jesus, as they come to know Him. Paul's calling us to make our budgets and sacrifice in other areas so that we can give more to support the church and pay our pastor so he is free to preach and counsel and study and pray, not so we get a benefit, but so that the people next to us get a benefit. If you're giving to your church because you like the church and you like all the benefits, that's not really the goal. You give to the church so that the brothers and sisters around you hear the gospel. Friends, Paul is calling on us to share what we have with one another by providing teaching. And you say, look, I don't think I love these people enough to give for that reason. I appreciate your honesty. Maybe we should talk about that. Because in verses 7 to 8, Paul says that our giving is to test our purity, the purity of our faith. He says, do not be deceived because no matter what we may think, God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, that will we also reap. And you say, what does giving have to do with mocking God? Well, imagine I wore like a PETA shirt, like People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I had a PETA shirt on, and I went to a hot dog eating contest. Their whole thing is we don't want people to eat animals, and then I wear their shirt to a contest where they eat like the grossest parts of the animals, right? That would be so contrary to their message so contrary to their whole purpose, so contrary to what I'm saying by my clothing, that it would mock PETA. In the same way, when someone says they're a Christian, when they say they love God and they don't give, they are mocking God because they are living so contrary to the nature of the one to whom they identify with. Friends, do not be deceived. We cannot mock God and get away with it. His rule is absolute. And Paul compares it to the rule of sowing and reaping. If I sow corn, what, I'm what am I going to reap? Corn. It's not, I hope it's corn. It's going to be corn. If I put potatoes in the ground, what's going to come out? I'm if I do it, probably nothing. But what should come out if you do it right is potatoes, right? What we sow is what we reap. In the same way, if we sow our money and our time and our efforts into the flesh, into the things of this world and the things that are temporary, we will reap only corruption because those things only corrupt. But if we sow our time and our money and our energy into the Spirit, into this Christ's church and His people and His pleasure, what will we reap? Eternal life. Now, Paul is not saying you get to buy eternal life or some prosperity gospel nonsense and heresy. He's not saying that. He's saying the opposite. He's not saying give a certain amount and then you get a certain amount of money back. Total opposite. You sow to the spirit and you reap spiritual things. You reap eternal life. You reap rewards in the next life, not in this one. It's not about today. It's about the next day. It's about everlasting life. So my friends, are we sharing with one another? Are we sacrificing for one another? Are we giving up our desires and our pleasures so that we can better provide for the preaching of the gospel in our community and to our missionaries? Are we giving that way? Or are we hoarding our money and our time to ourselves? This sows and reaps corruption. It may feel good for a time, but it will not last. And friends, I, I praise God. I think our church is pretty good at faithfully giving their money. I've rejoiced in that. I've been thankful for that. Certainly we can always grow, but I rejoice in it. I really do. 
But I think an area where we're starting to struggle is giving of our time, especially in commitments. Often our members will make plans or put things on the calendar knowing it will cause us to miss gatherings, and we think, it's not a big deal, I'll listen online, I'll keep studying on my own, but friends, missing church isn't about us. It's not about us. We're meant to gather together to share with one another, to encourage one another. We can't bear one another's burdens if we're not here. Yet in our pride, we think, oh, no one really noticed, so I'll just skip this one and make other plans. But when we choose to skip Sunday school, we're choosing to skip helping our brothers and sisters learn and understand God. When we choose to skip our main service, we're choosing to skip encouraging and sharing in our family's faith. When we choose to skip our family nights and our business meetings, we're choosing to reject our authority over one another and our responsibility to one another. Friends, skipping church is not about us. Skipping church is about skipping out on God's call on our lives. It's a serious thing. Now, please don't hear me as some grumpy pastor who's saying, you have to be here every time the doors are open or Jesus doesn't love you. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I want to be very clear about that. I understand God sometimes providentially hinders us, sickness and other things. I, I get that. But what I am saying is that Scripture is clear. It is very different to be hindered by God from coming to service than to choose something else over fulfilling the commands of Christ and the covenant obligations we have made to one another. There's a big difference. Friends, hear the warning of the Scriptures. Our lives are meant to be one of sharing with one another, of bearing with one another. We simply cannot, cannot live that life out if we are choosing to do other things. This requires a lot of sacrifice. It requires us to share our whole lives with one another, to make church the reason for missing other things. It seems hard. But friends, the Scriptures say, do good to everyone, especially of the household of faith. Not of the household of your house, the household of faith. The household of faith. Not the household of your job or the household of your club or the household of whatever thing, the household of faith. Verse 10 tells us that. And you say, fine, I'll show up. And I'm glad for that, but that's not what we're going for. <laughs> that's not what Scripture calls us to. In verses 9 and 10, we see we not only bear with one another and share with one another, verses 9 and 10 call us to care for one another. And we do it with hope. Look at verses 9 and 10. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Paul calls us to care for one another with hope because he knows how easy it is to grow weary in doing good to one another and caring for one another. That's a hard thing. Don't hear that I'm up here saying, just come to church. It's super easy. I mean, it's my job, so like I have to come. <laughs> also, I want to come, but like, don't, don't think I'm here and I don't want to be. I love being here. But my point is, I know that it's hard to live that way, and Paul does too. We write check after check, and we're tempted to wonder if it's even doing any good. We invite person after person, and they don't come. We train our kids to try and sit through service and love one another well, and they just don't seem to get it. We encourage that brother every time we see him, and still he seems just as depressed, and we love that sister, but she still feels so alone. We come to service after service after service, and we have to say no to so many other things in life, and if we're honest, we grow weary, and we become discouraged, and we lose heart. And if we want to lose, use uh, less biblical terms, we're selfish, and we're bored, and we think it's unfair, and especially if, if we've been faithful for a while, and we start looking around, and we're like, look, that person's not giving as much as me. Why should I have to sacrifice like this? So we give up. But friends, imagine if farmers did this. They go out day after day, and they sow corn into the ground, and they do that for a few days, and they look around, and they're like, all I've done is move dirt around. It's just as brown. It's just as muddy. There's no life. I'll just give up. Well, all of us would starve, Right? But that's not what God has called us to. He's called us to sow to the Spirit in hope because He says we will reap a reward. Not necessarily today, in God's due time. Spurgeon used this analogy. He said, sowing in a field looks like a losing business because we put good corn in the ground and we never see it anymore. With a temporary mindset, it seems like a waste. Sowing to the Spirit seems a very fanciful, dreamy business for we deny ourselves and apparently get nothing for it. Why am I saying no to all this stuff when nothing's happening? Friends, is that how you feel today about the church? Do you feel wearied by doing good? I have felt that way often this year. 
Do you feel like all, the, all you do is deny yourself and you just get nothing back for your work? Friends, I know that feeling. Paul knows that feeling. Every Christian who's ever lived knows that feeling. But we have hope because God promises us that in due season, we will reap. Not might, not hope to. We will reap. You plant corn, you'll probably get corn. But you sow to the Spirit, you will reap a harvest. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. In fact, you may look around at your life and you say, it's still brown and muddy and I don't see a single thing sprouting up yet. But in due season, in God's sovereign timing, He has promised that you will reap. The God who makes corn grow is the same one who promised that you would have a harvest. How then should we live? We live a life dedicated to the glory of God. Verse 10 tells us, because God has promised we will reap, so then, because that's true, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to one another, especially to those who are of the household of faith. As much as I wish I could say, look, just love one another enough to, to, put, to bear with one another, that's great until we, we become really annoying and we get fed up with one another. Like, loving one another is good, but it's not enough. That's not the reason God gives. The ultimate hope and joy, the ultimate motivation for our faithfulness to one another is that we will reap a reward from God, for He has promised that, a, a reward in heaven. And you say, yeah, but this doesn't apply to me because Paul said to only do it as I have opportunity and I'm really busy and I just don't have opportunities. That's not what Paul meant. How do we know that? Because Paul is speaking about the reward that will come after our death or after the rapture, the reward that will come at the judgment seat of Christ. So the opportunity he's speaking about is not I have a free five minutes before my next meeting. The opportunity he's speaking about is you haven't died yet and Christ hasn't come back yet. So if you are breathing, you have this opportunity he's talking about. It doesn't matter what's on your schedule. Once Christ returns, that opportunity will be lost. But every day we draw breath, we have opportunity. So let us put all our effort into doing good to everyone, to everyone, but especially to the household of faith because they are our family. And we understand this. I'm called to love everyone, but I should love my wife more because she's my family. We are called to love everyone, but we should love our church more because they're our family. Friends, Paul, I think it's just gracious. He does not sugarcoat the Christian life. There will be days when we are weary of helping others bear their burdens, and we are just tempted to give up. There will be days when we are weary of giving and attending, and we just want to use our time and our money for ourselves. There will be days when we are so weary of doing good to others that we are tempted to just stop sowing and go live for ourselves. But what has God said in His Word? That if we truly are his people, we will be involved in his counseling work. He has called us to bear and share and care. That's what it means to be a Christian. And, and honestly, though there will be days where that seems exhausting and unfair and unpleasant, when those days come, our pride and our abilities will not keep us out there. The f results and the earthly fruit that we see won't keep us out there because we may not have any. Not even our love for one another will last because these burdens are heavy and sharing is costly and caring is exhausting. How then can we remain on the field? Christ did not give up on us. He did not grow weary. He endured, like I, I don't know how hard your life is. Christ endured more. He endured more and he did not give up. And he has promised us that if we fulfill the law of Christ, we will reap eternal life. Friends, pour yourselves into the Spirit. Sow to the Spirit, sow to the church, and reap eternal life. I pray we would live in light of that promise today. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for the promises we have in Scripture. We are thankful for the truth of your word. Most centrally, we are thankful that Christ did not give up on us. And we pray that we would be faithful to not give up on one another, trusting that you will provide. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.